Hi, and welcome to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast presented by Wolf Precision Incorporated, where we learn about and share long range shooting and custom rifle building. I am your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome to the show. Hi, and welcome to episode 141 of Wolf Precision's Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome to the show. In this episode, we're going to continue on our Fundamentals of Marksmanship series, and we're going to be talking about groups and group therapy. Now, not the subject group therapy, that'll be coming later, but the concept, the mindset, and just how people look at it, both correctly and incorrectly, and maybe some, I don't know, maybe false accolades. So how do you test yourself as a shooter? How do you know how good you really are? So this is going to be a good one. Long overdue and a great subject to talk about here on the air. So without further ado, here we go. Before we get started, we would like to say thank you to Krieger Barrels. Krieger is the maker of fine cut rifle barrels made out of the great state of Wisconsin. They are a family owned and operated business, one of the oldest in the custom barrel making world. They also offer a new program called KriegerDirect.com. We can log on and order your barrel and have it in as little as two to three business days. So if you need a barrel and you want the best, and you need it now, stop over to KriegerDirect.com. That's KriegerDirect.com. We'd also like to thank Wolf Precision's online long-range shooting school, where you can attend a world-class long-range shooting school from the convenience of your own home. With over 10 hours of instructional video now posted live, you can stop on and enjoy all of the benefits and teachings from here at our long-range shooting school from the convenience of your own home. So if you want to become the best shooter you can and you want to grow as a marksman, stop over to wolfprecision.net and log on to our online long-range shooting school today. All right, so this ought to be a great podcast, and we have Richard back in the studio with us. Say hi, Richard. Yeah, good morning, Jamie. <laughs> so we were just talking about this yesterday, and um, when we do a podcast and invite Richard on, how I don't really give him much of a, a subject matter what we're going to talk about. No, you don't give me anything, Jamie. You say, <laughs> uh, hey, we're going to do a podcast tomorrow, and I don't even bother asking what the subject is because I know you like to surprise me. Yeah, I think it's fair. I think um, for... It's not fair, but it's fun. <laughs> there, that's a good way to yeah, put it. Yeah. <laughs> not fair, but fun. And Lori was saying here in the office how it's really unfair that you're not telling them like to think about the subject. And I said, you know, I like to sort of throw them at him in the morning and just get the questions at him live without letting him think too much about it because it allows almost like a pure audience type answer that he didn't have time to prepare for the podcast. He didn't think about it in depth. These are things that are on the surface level answers that he would give, you know, and saying, hey, if somebody really asked you this for the first time at a show, how would you answer it and what would your reply be? So I, th- I think it's fun and it keeps it interesting too. It keeps them on his toes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> uh, so we talk about this a lot here at the shooting school. We do a lot of testing. We shoot a lot, not as much as we'd like to. It's winter time here right now. We might try to actually get out today, but The common thing that people ask and the common subject around any campfire is groups and, you know, hey, what kind of groups can I expect? Or, hey, you know, what's the average marksman's capability? And then you always and we always get pictures submitted of all these different groups and you look at the groups and, you know, three shots, five shots, you'll see them all over the place as far as how many rounds are fired into them. But this podcast I want to talk about, since we're into the fundamentals of marksmanship, is how do you really gauge yourself as a marksman? I mean, what is realistic? What can most shooters shoot? How do you test yourself for the truth, right? Because you can skew the numbers. You can shoot a nice three-shot group, cut it out, put it on your refrigerator, and that's true as a marksman. Or you can really know the truth. And I think in some cases, some people don't want to know. Would, would be another part of it, you know, that there's a little bit of competition and... Yeah, it's bragging rights. Bragging rights, yeah. You know, to have that 1.2 group that you shot, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I personally don't care for it. It's not my... It's not what I'm into. I think that on the whole, as in most things, if you're trying to improve, then it's a journey to get from there to there. Or from here to there, I should say. Mm-hmm. And um, and then you're trying to do certain things that develop you in whatever you're, you're trying to do. 
right? Mm-hmm. So, for instance, I'll give a – oh, here we go, Richard's story. So I used to be a good golfer, and uh, the way I used to improve my golf game in the springtime was – I would start keeping score, but not in the traditional way. So I would start measuring fairways hit off the tee, greens hit from the fairway, and my number of putts. And then as I looked at those statistics that I was creating as I was starting to play in the, you know, in the early spring, I would focus on the things that were bad in my game from the previous week. So if I didn't hit any, any fairways, I would start hitting my long irons and my, and my driver three-word to start getting more consistency to make sure I hit the fairway. And then if I wasn't hitting my approach shots and hitting the green, then I'd start practicing with my mid irons and so on and so forth. And that's how I improved. And and by the way, I I was a legitimate four handicap golfer. So it it actually did work, you know, and every once in a while I have to go for a tune up and go visit a pro and Hey, I'm doing this funky thing. Like what the heck am I doing here? And my old pro in uh, in Hackettstown, New Jersey, would uh, would help me out, and he'd literally, you know, it would be like the sensei, you know, he'd touch one part of my arm and go, you know, focus on this, and everything would fall into place. But that's another story. Yeah, I have never gotten hooked into golf. I am not a golfer, so I can only say that it's I've got enough, you know, bad habits that I've gotten obsessed over. So it might not be a bad thing that I've never really tried it. It's just like shooting in that you, you're you looking for a mechanical consistency. Do you mm-hmm. know, it's the same thing, it right? It's you, fundamentals. You, you're, you're looking, for, yeah, it's fundamentals. And, and uh, you know, uh, uh, one of my favorite books is a Ben Hogan book, which all golfers will recognize, which is the, uh, the Modern Fundamentals, I think he calls it, the, the Modern Fundamentals of Golf or something like that. And he talks about hand position and stance and, and how to relax, and how to get movement going, which is hard, right? You stood over the ball, everything's stationary. How do you get that movement going so that everything flows in the right way? So it's it's very similar to shooting in some respects. You can be put into weird stances. You know, you stood on the edge of a, of a bunker trying to hit the ball that's either just in the bunker or just out of the bunker. So it's the same as shooting, right? When you go field shooting, mm-hmm. you know, you can get in some weird thing. There's a rock stuck in your side and you've yet you've still got to, you know, make a good shot and execute a good shot. So I see a lot of similarities there in, in the way I think about it. What are your thoughts? Oh, absolutely. I think fundamentals in any sport, once you understand that there's rules to every game, and how you have to master each part of the process of the swing or the shot. Right. It's, 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 there's that learning curve. I think where a lot of shooters maybe shortchange themselves because we're talking about the fundamentals of marksmanship is they don't have a baseline of how they really are as a shooter. They don't have a number to say, okay, how can you improve if you don't know where you're at? And, yeah. and then yeah. how do you set your goals and say, okay, I want to grow as a shooter you know, I want to be able to shoot 20, 30% better. I want to do better at distance. But if you don't know fundamentally, truthfully, where you're at and where you're at as a shooter now, how do you gauge yourself to get better in the future? Right. And there's a, and just to carry on that as well, there's a mindset that comes into these games that we play. And, uh, you know, I would, uh, and I still do it today, right? If I, if I shoot a, uh, if I'm shooting and I hit the center center of a plate, I always say to myself, you know, that was a momentary lapse of brilliance. <laughs> there we go. Right. Because I, what I'm trying, what I had to do within my golf game as I was maturing as a golfer was accept that you don't hit every shot perfectly. And so you can't beat yourself up if you're not down the center of the fairway, as long as you're in the fairway and you're not on the wrong side of it. You know, you go to a championship course, you can be on the wrong side of the fairway, but let's not go there. But as long as you're in the fairway, you've given yourself a shot, right? And that's the key is that, you know, if you don't shoot a three eights group, is that the be all and end all of everything shooting? I mean, it kind of is in some of the games, right? If you're a bench rest shooter or whatever, but for our style of shooting, or if you're going to go hunting or, you know, that kind of thing. If you're shooting a half inch group, if you're consistently, legitimately a half inch group shooter, whether it's raining, you're freezing, or the sun's out and it's 105 degrees, you're a legitimate half inch shooter. And uh, I'll give you a lot of respect for that. Um, if you're a legitimate three quarter inch sh- shooter with a with an off the shelf rifle, 
I'm going to give you a lot of respect for that. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that needs a lot of nursing, right? Well, I think the first thing is, and we're going to cover this here as we move forward in this podcast, is you really need to know where you're at and be honest with yourself as far as where you are fundamentally. And also, I talked about this in previous podcasts, is you have to remove the emotional part of it. Like in the business world and a lot of the professionals that we see come through the school here, they are alpha males for sure. I mean, they want to win and be the best at everything. Right, right. And shooting will hand you a big slice of humble pie, and you can't force it. You can't bully it. You can't make it happen. This is all finesse. It's like asking that girl out at the movie theater. You have to be spot on your A game, and it's all finesse. It, it's not going to happen when you, you know. Think about back when you were a teenager. You know, if you if you go in all you know raging and or like, it's the approach. Yep. You, yep. you have to, and, and good or bad, right? You got to keep every all your emotions in check, and you, you got to be willing to take the no and the yes, right? Right, right. So, But just, it, that comes from the way that you, I feel it comes from the way that you practice, right? Mm -hmm. Let's not call it training, let's call it practice, because you're trying to practice over and, ag over and again the proper techniques, which, you know, sometimes you can't get into the proper techniques when you're in a competition or a hunting situation, right? Expediency mm -hmm. over perfection at that point. But when you're in a practice environment, you can afford to, you know, get down behind the rifle and then go, oh, wait, there's something doesn't quite feel right. Get back off the rifle and get back into it again. And you can afford to take your time. Like the worst thing you can ever do is like, I've got a new rifle to shoot, but we've got several rifles to zero today. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to bring my new rifle to shoot today because I want to I want to spend some loving time with it ah, for those so, first shots. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny to hear you say that because a lot of times when we go to test rifles and the months pass, Richard would be like, where's your rifle? And I'm like, oh, I didn't bring it. Yeah, and, and I know. And now it's making sense. Like, <laughs> you don't want to take your own practice rifle or your own training rifle because you're shooting all these different rifles and you're so focused on that yeah. that it sort of takes away from the enjoyment of working That's, with Well, yours. especially those those first few rounds. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's special. It's very special. <laughs> <laughs> so most shooters, if I was to say... If you were to say to me, what I, what do I think a great shooter should be able to shoot? I'm talking above the 80% mark. So I always say that at any given match, 20% of the shooters at that match are competitors, 80% are participants. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. I mean 20% are on their A game that day who, by the way, the next match could be on their B game and be in the 80%. And then the other 80% are practicing and training, right? But if you was to ask me what I think that top 20%, their consistent capabilities would be as a shooter, my guess if we did a huge baseline test is that they're probably consistently half minute or a little better shooters. Yeah, I would say so as well. I mean, you get into the situation, uh, I think I talked about this on another podcast, where if you have enough training hours in on the rifle or whatever you're not constantly worrying about the fundamentals as much as you are about making the shot on the target so you've you've moved your concentration away from everything to do with driving the the weapon and you've moved it on to just focusing on your sight picture and you and then your breathing and then you're you know that's it you know you've you've made the shot and so I think that if you have enough training hours behind you, you're able to focus more on other things because the physical side of driving the rifle has now become automatic, right? And that's what you're looking for. And we've seen these guys at, at various competitions along the way. They're not fast, they're smooth. <laughs> you know, they know what they do and they put the thing in the right place. They cycle the action without you know, messing around. They know how many rounds are in the magazine. They know where the next magazine is. All that little stuff that isn't, you know, is important, but isn't taking the shot. They've already taken care of that in their mind. And now they're focusing on the shot. And so that's a roundabout way of answering your question, which is, do I think a really good shooter is a half minute guy? Yeah, he's a half minute guy. And sometimes he's better as well. Right. And, and he's a half minute guy and he's probably, He's a three-quarter minute guy in the wind who, after that first shot, becomes a half-minute guy on the second and third shot. Like, once he dials in, he's looking for the center of the plate, 
you know, I always say center up on people. It's okay hitting the plate, but really, if you're if you're really into it, you're always trying to aim for the middle of the plate, right? And and that's so so yeah. I think if I see someone who can shoot half inch groups, and I'm I'm always like, oh, there's, there's a shooter. Yeah. You know? So and now it doesn't mean that that shooter can't shoot a quarter minute group. So how do I say he's a half minute shooter? Well. We got privy to some testing that's going on right now, and I can't say how much I was really impressed with the test and the data that they acquired, but when they were testing ammo, just right out of the gate, baseline testing, it was five five five-shot groups, and then it was averaged, and then it was five five five-shot groups for something else, and then that was averaged, and then it was five five five-shot groups. So this was a 125-round test, five shots per group. And the average between the two shooters that were involved in the testing was 0.4 MOA with factory ammo. Some getting out 0.6, some getting 0.3. But that, in my mind, if you can lay that gauntlet down and you can do that over and over again yeah, as a that's shooter. Yeah, solid shooting right there. That is shooting, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So when you go to the range, I think for the get out of the gate, if you want to know – where you're at so you know where you are trying to get to as a shooter is like when we were testing some rifles uh bruce was doing some testing out in idaho and he was sending me 10 shot groups back we were doing like 100 yard 120 yard just testing with multiple different ammo just basically burning barrels out really and we were just shooting 10 shot groups because it really sucked to sh- you had to put more targets up if you're shooting five shot groups right and he was sending me targets that were like you know, these are half minute targets, 10 shot groups. And he's putting like no effort into it. Like he's just like, just banging away. And he goes, you know, just for someone banging away, burnt and barrels up, I'm really impressed with these groups. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit, 10 shot groups, Bruce. Yeah. That's incredible. Well, you know, it, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what I would say to do is, you know, leave the groups to groupies. Don't hyper focus on shooting that one group to brag about. Try to stay focused, you know, on fundamentals. But if you really want to know where you're at fundamentally wise, what I would say is get all of your equipment set up. Try to go on a range day that's not super windy and you got all the environmentals playing hell with you. I mean, this is you test. Think of a test day. You know, this is you going to college and you've got to go take your exam, right? Try mm-hmm. to pick the day that you're going to go get a baseline number that's that's reasonable, right? And what I would say to do is shoot your cold bore shot, follow up shot. You know, try to make sure everything's good, and then shoot five five shot groups. Each time breaking off the gun and giving the gun like five, ten minutes and you five, ten minutes to cool down and reset again and then average it. And then, you know, you might shock yourself actually on how good of a shooter you are and how consistently you are. But where it'll come out is like when you get those wild flyers, like you get three and four and then one's really out there and three and four and one's really out there. And then so like for some of the testing that was finished up last week, which we'll talk more about here in future podcasts. The good part was is that these five shot groups, there was no what what they were looking for was no flyers. Like they were actual groups. Yeah. So yeah. there were five consistent rounds going in the same spot, yeah. opening up round wise like a basketball to the group size, but not like four in mm. and then one way out, skewing the whole average. And then what most shooters will do when that happens with that outlier. Will they count it in their group, or will they say that was a flyer? Well, from what I've uh. seen on YouTube, they everyone call, oh, I called that one a flyer. Yeah, and I'm like, well, wait there. If it was one of the five rounds that were in the magazine that you were trying to put in the group, that's the group. And by the way, guns <laughs> don't shoot flyers; people do. <laughs> yeah, you know. So if it's a flyer, that's you right. own it. Yeah, you know, exactly. You did that. Their yeah, gun just yeah. didn't accidentally throw that out there. You know. Yep. So count up part as your group. And then if you really want to test yourself, try to shoot some 10-shot groups. You might surprise yourself on how well you'll do. The only trick to shooting bigger groups than five is you have to have an aiming point. Like when we talk about shooting school, how to find center of center when the center disappears. Because you're going to shoot the center of the target out. If well, you can always just dial it off a little bit as well. Like if you uh, – I mean if shooting groups is your thing – then you need a clean aim, aiming point and the group to form elsewhere on the target. Mm. If if that's your thing, that's what you got to do, right? So um, not, I don't want to confuse anyone here on the podcast. What Richard's talking about is is so he's not not punching 
holes where he's aiming. But as shooters, you're probably not going to do that. And I, as new shooters, I would not recommend yeah, yeah, doing yeah. that. Don't, don't do that. But what to do is you'll use... Become, you'll become a bench rest shooter. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you use the concentric rings on the target. So we'll post up maybe one of our practice targets here. And just keep focusing on where the center of the concentric rings is at. Because the, the aiming point's going to disappear. And when that happens, you're going to open your groups up because you're aiming at at the center of the target, not dead center of the target and so there's techniques to all this and we cover a lot of it with here at the school and some of the targets we put up are actually designed to teach you some of these processes to get away from the danger zones of this but so when you're starting with the fundamentals of marksmanship you are what you are as a shooter there's no skewing the numbers the averages will always play out and it's always better to be truthful with yourself as far as a good shooter goes a lot of the targets that we put up when we test this so we put up a dot drill that has very small dots on it and we don't let them shoot more than one shot at each dot and there's like 14 or 15 dots on there as they keep working through it gives them a clean aiming point but then it allows them to play the game of averages they can't hide 15 consecutive one shot bullseye shots we can look at it as a group as a whole now and use the center of the dot to sort of gauge what's going on and to see you know where they're at fundamentally watch for their flyers, check their zeros. There's lots of information we can get from it, but they can't see the group forming. They, all they see is 15 dots across the big page, but what we see is 15 aiming points stacked on top of each other in the end. Yeah, and it's it's also interesting, you know, when you see a target downrange that's, uh, I'll say it's a one-inch dot, a lot of people without further instructions think that the test parameter is hit the dot. Whereas what we're looking for is find the center of the dot and put a bullet hole through the center of the dot, yeah. right? So, you know, that's an expectation and reality thing, right? If you don't set the expectation, then the, the reality is not going to match it. Yeah. But uh, I, I think that uh, it's interesting how that progresses into longer distance shooting where, you know, you're shooting at a a round plate at 600 yards and I know a lot of people are shooting high magnification scopes these days. I don't personally do that, but I think that it makes it interesting that if you practice shooting at the middle of a dot where you can't actually see the middle, when you get out to a plate at long distance, you're shooting at the dot in the center of the plate where you can't actually identify the pure center of the plate. And I think it. that's, you know, it's a it's a good mental, um, how would you put that, sort of like a... It's mental preparedness, right? You're preparing yourself that no matter what round target I'm looking at, whether it's right in front of me at 100 yards or it's out at 600 yards and maybe it's a little bit more fuzzy because of whatever's going on atmospherics-wise, you're still aiming for the center of the center of the center of the plate, and that's what you're looking for. And I think you know that's that's a good side benefit of tr- of training hard and and trying to shoot good groups i'm not really a group shooter myself jamie will attest to that he's seen some of my targets <laughs> uh i'm not really a group shooter myself you know but i do like to shoot the 18 dot drill that's like one of my favorites it's like if you're only going to go to the range and you've got like half an hour 45 minutes that's the target because one shot per dot you know, win or lose kind of a thing. And if you're really on your game, you can overlay that target no matter where the shots land on that day with ambient conditions or whatever your stats your rifle's at, they'll overlay and you'll look at it and go, holy heck, I just shot a whatever group yeah, on the dot drill. The you, can see the, you can see where it's formed up on the target. So with the shooting school here, what will happen is as – There's different training. We're talking in-person shooting school as well. Is all of a sudden, once that starts to make sense, those little dots that we're putting up, they'll start hammering them. They're the size of peanut M&Ms or maybe a little bit smaller. And at 100 yards... Peanut M&Ms are the only chocolate that hasn't gotten smaller, right? (laughs) That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, so, you know, it's probably a little bit less than the the peanut M&M, maybe a little bit bigger than a regular M&M. But they'll hit like 8, 9, 10. Right. I mean, if you shoot, if you tape up 10 M&Ms at 100 yards and you, you bust all 10 of them, that's a hell of a shooter. Yep. And so when you learn these techniques of aim small, miss small, and you learn how to find the center of center, it brings all of the outside edges in and really in, improves your shooting. And that's what you're trying to do with the fundamentals. So 
when you're practicing this, what I would say is be open and honest with yourself. We don't always all shoot perfect every single time. There are days you're just not on your A game. There are days when there's other things that just got you all messed up from your setup to your, your mindset when you even got there. But be truthful with where you're at in your shooting and just know for a fact that most of the stuff that you see people post online, I love writers, by the way, but they are the biggest bullshitters on the planet when it comes to the <laughs> shit that they write in some of the magazines. You know, they'll just cherry pick a hundred different groups. They'll take pictures of whatever group they had archived and call it good. They're in the job of selling rifles, and so they'll do whatever numbers. But my experience with writers coming here is that most of them really can't shoot at all, mm. um, at average at best, and yet they're the ones writing all the stuff that we're reading about how awesome these rifles are. So be careful what you read in the magazines and what you see people posting online. I mean, every once in a while, everybody does get a lucky gr- a group in, and that happens to all of us, and we're all happy when we see it. But don't use that as a way to verify or validify your abilities to shoot and that you're out of the running because you can't perform that way. That was that guy on his best day with a little bit of luck following him around. Right, right. So if you come into this and you're, let's just say, a sub-1 MOA consistent shooter, you're probably still better than average. And if you can, you can start hovering right around a half a minute consistently, five-shot groups, like test yourself, you cannot downplay that. That, that is a great marksman. I mean, by all stretch of the imagination, that would be you hitting a five-inch plate at a 1,000 yards five times in a row. Right. Which is really hard to do. Yep. If you keep it into reality. So, Richard, if somebody was going out to try to baseline their abilities, A, I'm trying to discourage them from beating themselves up on their group expectations right out of the gate, right? There's a lot that goes into this from the ammo, the optics. There's a million things that can make your groups go good or bad, including what the shooter's capable of. But... Trying to encourage you to keep practicing and know where your baseline is at so then you can start growing from there. Um, what would be your suggestion as far as, okay, I'm zeroing my gun. Let's let's test myself right out of the gate. How would Richard set himself up to shoot a couple groups to see where you're at fundamentally group-wise? Well, let's first, let me just explain what I do when I go to the range, right? So I I go to the range. I only take one weapon. Like, I don't roll up there with five different things to shoot. And I go there and make sure I have enough time to go to the range, do what I want to do, and get back in time before I get in trouble with the missus. Right? So I go, and then I'll, you know, just get set up, sit around a little bit, look at the weather, and figure out if the wind is going to affect what I'm doing today. And then I'll start getting behind the gun. I'll spend a couple of minutes just, you know, making sure that everything feels okay. If it's a new rifle, like if I was bringing my new rifle to the range today, the first thing I would do is I'd check all my screws are are tight, you know, talk to, to the correct settings. And then I would just get down behind the gun, get comfortable, make sure that it feels the way it always feels. And I shoot an AI stock, had it for 17 years. It feels good every time I get behind it. And then I'll do a little dry fire. So uh, getting used to new triggers, right? I put new triggers in from Trigger Tech, so that was that was good. Uh, so getting used to new trigger, same trigger weight, one point seven five pounds, but now I've got the flat, straight trigger shoe on it rather than curved off of the um, jewel that I had. Uh, so getting used to that, and then I'll do a little dry fire. And what I'm looking for there is just you know the absolute fundamentals. Do I feel comfortable in how I am laying behind the gun? Hand pressure. Face pressure on the cheek piece. Is the cheek piece in the same place? Did I move it around? Whatever, you know, normal kind of stuff. And then just breathing and do a couple of dry fire shots. Cycle the action, you know, dr- you know guns dry, of course. Cycle the action. And then, you know, a few dry fire, probably just for a couple of minutes. You know, take a shot every 15, 20 seconds or whatever, just some dry fire, just for two minutes. And then I'll load a magazine. I'll have a dot out there and I'll fire first, you know, cold ball shot and a follow-up shot. And I actually record those in my data book. So those two shots go in my data book. Then I'll have the 18 or whatever that dot drill is. I put the dot drill out and I'll start shooting that. And honestly, I expect to hit (laughs) more than I miss, but I expect to hit a lot of those. And if I'm just absolutely nailing it, I might only shoot 10 rounds because I'm not really going to learn anything. You know what I mean? And then at my home range, I only have 200 yards so if I haven't shot the whole 18 dot drill, then I might fire a couple of shots at 200 yards to sh- just to shoot a group at 200, mm-hmm. just because that's a little bit more fun. 
It is. And shooting steel is a lot more fun than paper. So yeah. Richard's yeah. brought up about five or six really great points. So if you were asking me to give you some awesome pointers on how to get the best from you and how to prepare for this type of drill is number one, allow yourself the time at the range to perform the task. Don't get there in a rush or in a hurry. Number two, don't get there with your mindset somewhere else where it shouldn't be. I always tell guys, if, if you're having a bad day at work, that's a terrible time to yeah, go to the range. Yeah, it shooting. It is, yeah. <laughs> and same thing, if you've got a lot of stuff on your mind that's bothering you, you're just going to go and compound those problems laying behind a gun. It's gun's not going to perform now. It's just one more, one more egg in the face today, right? Yeah, so, one more stressor. Yeah, and then one rifle. I can't overemphasize how is like when you're really trying to learn as a marksman, you learn – by mastering it with a rifle like pick your rifle learn your rifle and run your rifle it'd be like learning to try to date by dating 16 different women with 16 different personalities at one time yeah it's hard it's very hard yeah and, and, and you know unless they're all in the same stock and they're all the same kind like you know if you had a there's richard with the ai stock right so if i had an ai stock and i had a 300 win mag in it and i had an ai stock and i had a 223 in it in it that's two completely different beasts to wrestle. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I, I probably wouldn't shoot those two particularly well back to back. I've never tried it, but I would think that I would probably not shoot those two well back to back. Now, if I'd done, if I was mostly like we had a fellow come through last year who was a 300 win mag aficionado, I would say, mm -hmm. that's all he shoots. It wouldn't matter to him if he went down in caliber. I would say he could probably go for go shoot pretty much anything that we regularly see, and he would do a good job with it. Yeah, and he's that actually building a six five Creed as we speak. Oh, good! Because he wants his wife to start shooting with him. Oh, cool! Yeah. Well, that's very cool. So, um, so I think the thing is, it's important to just go with one rifle and just be focused on, you know, what are you trying to do today, and have a plan. Yeah, and I would say if I was to throw a couple more pieces of advice in, and then we're gonna. Just give a quick thanks to our sponsors here real quick, but um, go there with the time, and then don't go with groups. Unless they're a very close friend, don't put the pressure of making it a social event and having people looking over your shoulder, busting your stones, and, you know, if they're close friends, like me and Rich will go, and we'll joke around and have fun, but when he's shooting, you know, I might pick on him a little bit or vice versa, but it's all in good fun, but he knows he's not under any pressure. I'm, I'm glazing over his shoulder to point out all of his faults. or Yeah, and he's filming me. Yeah, and I'm filming him when he's not <laughs> shooting, right? Look right. at what he's doing. So if I had to add a couple more things in there, I would say don't go with a, a group or big group so you can focus on you so you're not worried about entertaining, you're not, you're not being distracted, right? And then also you're not feeling the pressure of other people judging you or, or watching your targets or just putting that additional pressure on you uh, while you're trying to actually grow as a shooter and then get out and practice so i would challenge everybody to to go out and do a baseline test so i'm going to take uh, just a quick moment and thank some sponsors here and then we'll dive into a couple uh things with this so again this podcast is about group shooting and just keeping it real as far as your expectations and how to grow as a shooter and i think you really need to understand where you're at and then you can sort of gauge as you're growing you know, and yeah, just learn. a parting a parting shot from Richard. <laughs> I, I think that if we can, myself included here, I don't think I'm the be all and end all of shooters that I can give people a lot of advice. But I think that one of the things I always try and do is I try and like be calm for that ten seconds before the before the important shot. And if you can just forget all the the BS that goes on in our lives and just focus on one, th you know, one or two things then I think that you can uh, you can sort of make the bullet go where it's supposed to go. And he brings up another good point. When I would go to the range and practice, even 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I would be there at my one range. I could fire right at the crack of dawn. Mm -hmm. I'd be there with a cup of coffee watching the sun come up. And the reason being is I was the only one there. Right. I could sit there, relax a little bit, think about what I'm trying to work on that day. Or I'd go at the last hour before it got dark. And because everybody left. And so, you know, I got a chance to go there, relax, let everybody clean their stuff up. And then I got, it was my happy, happy place. You know, I mean, yep. I wanted to enjoy my time there. And sometimes having that quiet space around you is a nice thing, especially at this type of training. So I would intentionally schedule my range visits, you know, even during the week, early morning or late evening. And, um, I would try to do it when a lot of people weren't there. That way I, I wasn't running down range to change targets because somebody's in a hurry to shoot. I didn't have muzzle brakes blasting all around me. Right. Yep. Didn't have people asking me 65 questions while I'm trying to set up an actual work, which I didn't mind answering. 
But when you're working on your own stuff, sometimes it's like, ah, you know, you're just trying yeah, to get it's some too distracting done. and you just want to be focused on what you're doing. Yeah. 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 Calm, calm's always a good thing. And like in every part of your life, calm's a good thing. It is. It yeah. is. So before we continue on, I do want to say a quick thanks to two more sponsors. I want to thank Trigger Tech. They are a proud sponsor of the show. They've been with us since the beginning. They make fantastic triggers. The reason we use them here is there's, they're a roller bearing system, so they're safe. You know, they're end user adjustable. They make tons of different makes and models. They make different shoes, which is awesome. Uh, different pull weights, single stage, two stage, and for a lot of different selection of firearms. So one of the things, if you want to upgrade your game as a shooter, the, a really great way to do it factory or custom is to upgrade your trigger. And if you want to do that, we really recommend Trigger Tech. So you can stop over to TriggerTech.com. That's TriggerTech.com. And look at all of their selections today. We also want to thank MDT, maker of fantastic chassis. Uh, we have the new JAE700 here, the J Allen that they Looking just reintroduced. Looking forward to shooting that. Oh, my gosh. I'm on, I might yeah. actually have to put it in a barreled action in it today and take it to the range. Oh, that's a great idea. Mm-hmm. I'll do that. Yeah. I <laughs> Like so we're going to try to get some video work with it, do a review. We apologize that the review is a little long for the uh, getting this one released. We are in the process of uh, moving our facility into a brand new shop. But just for an example, MDT makes great chassis. They're reintroducing the the JAE 700, which is a great chassis. They have the HNT 26, great hunting chassis. They have a wide range of chassis. That yeah, they, and the Oryx, on. right? We've had a lot of people build on the Oryx recently as well. Yeah, I mean, for a, a $400 chassis yeah. that we would put up against any $1,000 solid, chassis on the market. Solid, yeah. solid little chassis there. So if you're shooting a factory rifle or a custom, one of the best ways to get the best out of the rifle is to get a stock that fits you well. And one of the ways to do it is to play around with some of the different chassis out there. And so you can stop over at MDT TAC. That's MDTTAC.com. And you can look at all of the great chassis today and keep an eye out. We'll have the new JE700 review coming up shortly. Might not be this week yet, but coming up shortly, we might get it to the range today. So Yeah, and if you're in the locale of Wolf Precision, we generally have a lot of stocks here. So if you're thinking of building a rifle with us, uh, stop down and take a look as a match wall. So we have our stock wall here, and we have lots of people that come in and actually, you know, even though they might not be building a custom rifle with us, you know, come and check it out. We love shooting. We love the community. So you can come down and check out all the different stocks, and we love to talk shop with it and get a chance to get your hands on them. Because the hardest part for chassis in general is unless you know somebody that owns one, you're buying on a leap of faith. That's right. That's exactly right. The other thing I want to say a quick thank you to, and we're going to give some shout outs to some of our Patreons for the podcast here. So if you would like to support the show, you can go over to Patreon. It's $3 a month. We call it the the Wolf Den, so you can join us or mm. or the Wolf Club, right? And so we had a bunch of Patreons sign up. We really do appreciate it. Three bucks a month. We put it towards all kinds of gear and equipment and the time that we take to, to produce the show. So I want to give a shout out to some of our new patrons. So we'd like to thank a couple of those that have signed up and are supporting the show. So we got Sean F., Robert H, Mike H, Mark L, Han C, and Brian M. Thank you for supporting the podcast. We really do appreciate it. And thank you for being part of the team here at Wolf Precision and helping make this show possible. So it is build season, and so we are really busy. We really appreciate everybody calling in and and taking the time to build custom rifles with us. We certainly appreciate that. We do offer the build assist, so we have customers starting to schedule their rifles now and coming in and doing the the build assist so they can come in and build the rifles with us. So really, this is the time of the year, too, just to throw it out there that if you are interested in building a custom rifle of any kind, whether it's with us or anybody else, uh, we always recommend trying to get your orders in before February and March at the latest because right about that time frame, everybody goes into panic mode trying to buy for the shooting season this year. Right. And back orders just get crazy long. So, yeah, and that's going to affect some of the stock manufacturers that are already have long lead times. Yes. And we also have had great success with the install your own trigger. Yeah. Right? So a lot of the customers have uh, taken us up on that uh, opportunity to do their own trigger installs and – we ship those rifles with a trigger install kit, and there's a video of how to do it that Jamie did uh, several months ago now. Right. So it's a pretty easy way to save a little bit of cash and spend more on your rifle. Yeah, I mean, we had offered out there that if you want to save $895 on your rifle to you know install your own trigger, and really it's just um, it's about allowing the customer to take more of their money and put it towards other things that would help them better with shooting. So if we can save the customers money in the process, and a lot of customers have taken up on it, which is pretty awesome. 
So we're going to continue on our fundamental series. We've got one more podcast next week. Between now and then, we'll try to do a little video review on the J. Allen 700. Just some parting words is try to go out and shoot some groups, and don't forget you can submit them. So if you want to submit some groups to us and let us take a look at them, we'd love to see them. So thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join us here at the show. We really appreciate it. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave a nice comment. That helps us a lot. If you would like to share it, uh, and you know somebody that's into long-range shooting, that also helps a lot as well. And as any time, you can always reach out with any questions We'll be doing a listener Q&A here soon. So if you have a question that you would like us to cover on the podcast, you can send it to contact at Wolf Precision. And if we read it on the air, we send you a nice T-shirt or hat as our way of saying thank you. So thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join us. You are listening to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast. Mm-hmm.